The scripture reading is John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. I will read it for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Amen. Loving brothers and sisters, members of branch churches and local sanctuaries, all believers and viewers in the world who are attending this service through the internet. In the last session, I told you that heaven is not a virtual world, but is a really existing world. After the life of one's body ends, it is not the end. The person will go to either the world of light or world of darkness, namely either heaven or hell. If people believe this fact, everybody would want to go to heaven. But just as we have to have a ticket to travel by train or airplane, we must also have the ticket to go to heaven. Without this ticket, nobody can go to heaven. Then, how can we get this ticket? Also, how do our spirit and soul that are on this earth go to heaven? What is the place where we will arrive in the kingdom of heaven? And what are we going to do there? Brothers and sisters, suppose people are listening to explanations about a tourist location. Then those who are planning to go to that place and those who are not have different attitudes and mindset when they listen. Those who do not have any plans to visit that place may just think, is there such a place? When would I be able to see that place myself? But another person who has already bought the air airplane ticket would have completely different thoughts. This person would pay attention to every detail including in which airport he will arrive, whether the immigration is complicated, what kind of transportation there is from the airport to the hotel, how the facilities are like in that hotel, and so on. It's the same thing with you. Those who are trying not to miss even one word of this sermon, they are those who are trying to go to heavenly kingdom, especially New Jerusalem. And those who feel no fun and fall asleep and have idle thoughts are those who are not really preparing themselves. Likewise, if you really want to go to heaven, you first have to check whether you have the ticket to enter there. For example, can you go to China without a visa? Also, can you go there without a, an airplane ticket? You will check the airplane ticket and everything. Likewise, to go to the heavenly kingdom, you should check whether you have the ticket now. If you do not have the ticket yet, when I explain about how to gain the ticket, I hope you will listen carefully and act by the word of God. Well, we do not ask for any money. Also, just as those who are planning to go on a trip or picnic would listen to the explanations about that place with so much eagerness and enthusiasm, I hope you will listen to these messages about heaven with that kind of mind. In that way, as you listen to each message, I pray in the name of the Lord that more faith will be added to your faith and more hope will be added to your hope. Brothers and sisters in Christ, now, how can we get the ticket to go to heaven? The ticket of heaven is given to God's children by God, who is the master of the heavenly kingdom. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Therefore, above all, to go to heaven, with the faith you have to accept Jesus Christ, who is the only begotten Son of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, 
Would you be saved then? Or will you not be saved? Yes or no? The question was vague. Just confessing Jesus as the Lord does not mean you will be saved. Even if you know that God raised him from the dead, you will not be saved. It says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, just by confessing with lips or knowing as knowledge will not save you. If you just know and confess with lips, it doesn't mean you will be saved. You will be saved only when you believe in heart and confess it with the lips. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So you should check whether you believe in heart or not. Those who believe in heart will reach righteousness. Those who believe in heart will live in the word of God. They will keep his commandments and live in the light. They will cast off all forms of evil and untruth and keep on praying. It's because they believe in their heart. That's why if you believe in heart, it will result in righteousness. Why? Because they cast off sins. They will become righteous. That's why when a person believes in heart, he will reach righteousness. And when that person confesses it with mouth, he will be saved. So you know about yourself, whether or not you are getting the ticket to heavenly kingdom, whether you are going towards New Jerusalem or not. If you just hear the word but just forget about it, and if you do not even keep the word of God, you cannot say you believe in heart. If you believe in heart, it will result in righteousness. To confess with our mouth that Jesus is our Savior and to believe in His resurrection in our heart is to believe the providence of the cross and the power of Jesus' blood. If you believe in heart, you will become righteous. So you will go into the Spirit. If you go into the Spirit, you will receive more blessings and help. Namely, it is to believe that to save us who would have fallen into hell and received the eternal punishment due to those sins, Jesus himself was hung and died on the cross, which is the symbol of the curse. And to redeem us from all sins, he shed his precious blood. If you can believe this fact from the heart, we will have a time of deep and thorough repentance with the tears and running nose and with thanks for the love of the Lord who suffered because of us. We are reminded of each sin we committed before and repent of them and we pray with repentance that we will now live in the light and by the word. God will receive the prayer of repentance, cleanse us of all sins with the precious blood of Jesus and then he gives us the Holy Spirit as a gift. So we become God's children who are born again by the Spirit. Then we can call God Father and our names are written in the book of life in heaven. If you get a ticket, your name will be recorded in the book of life in heaven. When you receive the Holy Spirit, God seals you as his son or daughter, as the citizen of heavenly kingdom. And he writes your name in the book of life. Then your Christian life begins to result in righteousness. Revelation chapter 20 verse 15 says, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There is the lake of fire and also the lake of sulfur. Revelation 21-27 says, And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying, shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You know what unclean things are if you read the Bible. You also know about abominations. Or liars. And you just learned about liars. Liars cannot go in there, but only those whose names are written in the book of the life of the Lamb. Likewise, only those who are God's children who have received the Holy Spirit by believing in Jesus Christ and those whose names are written in the book of life can enter the heavenly kingdom. But even if we have received the Holy Spirit and become God's children and our names are written in the book of life, the Holy Spirit might be quenched and our names might be blotted out from the book of life. 
For Revelation 3, 5 says, I will not erase his name from the book of life. Exodus chapter 32 verse 32 says, But now, if you will, forgive their sin, and if not, please blot me out from your book which you have written. Even the Apostle Paul said the same kind of thing. Moses prayed like this because he loved the souls and people so much. So the Bible mentions our names can be erased from the book of life. The reason why these expressions are written is to tell us that the fact that the names that are once recorded in the book of life may also be erased or blotted out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19 says, Do not quench the spirit. God tells us not to quench the spirit because it is possible to quench the Holy Spirit. If you receive the Holy Spirit, are healed and receive answer to something, you will be full of spirit. But if you fall into the world again and commit sins, you will have trouble in your heart and you will lose the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You may stop praying and your faith gets weaker and the grace disappears. Then it means the Spirit is being quenched. If the Spirit is quenched completely, then the spiritual faith disappears completely too. You may say you know and you believe, but you don't have spiritual faith to believe from heart. So even if you have little sickness, you won't come to receive prayer. You don't have the faith to receive healing through prayer. So you have to rely on hospitals. Do not quench the spirit. And this is to warn us that there are cases where the Holy Spirit is quenched. These cases are one of the three different cases. And to enter into heaven, we must never commit these sins. First John chapter 5 verse 16 says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. There are some churches that teach predestination. They say those who are predestined to be saved will be saved anyway, no matter what kind of sins they commit. Does it make sense? The Bible always tells us about sins both in Old and New Testaments. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. Namely, even prayer will not work on in this case. That's why I am always telling you this. It's the best not to commit any sin, but you should never commit any sin leading to death. Why? You won't be saved. That's why I many times taught you what kind of sins lead to death. Today there are many people, except you members here, who ask whether they are saved or not, and up to which point they can commit sins to receive salvation. But in our church, I clearly taught you where the line of salvation is and from which point you cannot be saved and what kind of sins will result in taking away your salvation and which sins can be forgiven. You cannot say, I didn't know. I taught you so many times, but some husband wrote me a repentance letter saying he committed some works of the flesh. He beat his wife frequently and he really wants to repent and turn away. He's afraid that he might not be saved because he beat his wife. He's afraid. I always explain to you, of course, you must not use any violence. But if you cannot be saved just because you used violence once or got angry once, who in this world will be saved? Even among you. Most of you must have done such a thing a couple of times. So, in that case, if you thoroughly repent and turn away, you will be saved. But there are sins that lead to death, and I am always telling you not to commit those sins. Even though we become God's children, we are born again, 
until we reach the complete measure of faith, we cannot really live by God's word, and we do commit big and small sins. But as we repent, God forgives us and we march toward heavenly kingdom again. There are sins that can be forgiven and do not lead to death. But there are also sins that cannot be forgiven in either this age or in the age to come. And thus, they are sins leading to death. The first is blasphemy and interfering with or opposing the works of the Holy Spirit as explained in Matthew 12, 31 to 32. 2, Mark chapter 3 verse 29 and Luke chapter 12 verses 10. The second is to willfully and deliberately commit sins and fall into moral corruption even after receiving the grace and knowing the truth and thus crucifying the Son of God again by putting him to open shame. It is explained in Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 and Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. The third kind of sin leading to death is to commit the works of the flesh that are evident, as explained in Galatians chapter 5, 21, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I already explained to you that in works of the flesh, there are different kinds of works of flesh too. Even if you use violence, if you repent and turn away, God will be pleased. This will not lead you to death. If you repent and turn back, you will be saved. But deliberate works of flesh will cause death. If you would like to find out more about this, please refer to the message of the cross. Also, I delivered sermons for several weeks about the sins leading to death, so please refer to them. One thing you should clearly understand is that as salvation is accomplished according to the word of God, even judgment is accomplished exactly according to the word of God in the Bible. Therefore, I hope you will be able to awake in spirit until your spirit safely reaches the heavenly kingdom. The second is to willfully and deliberately commit sins and fall into moral corruption even after receiving the grace and knowing the truth and thus crucify find the Son of God again by putting him to open shame. They know it is sin, but they go ahead and keep sinning. This is not just once. They willfully commit sins and corrupt. Then they have the afflictions in heart and the Holy Spirit is being quenched. They fall into the world and love it. They have to repent quickly, but they can't. Then God cannot help but forsake them fall into moral corruption even after receiving the grace knowing the truth and thus crucifying the son of God again by putting him to open shame how can we crucify the Lord again but those who willfully commit sins are those who are crucifying our Savior Jesus again I hope you will remember Hebrews 6 4 to 6 and Hebrews 10 26 to 27 Also, you must not commit any obvious works of flesh. And at the same time, you should also be able to discern which sins lead to death and which ones do not. But if you keep on committing the works of flesh again and again, it will lead you to a state where you cannot turn away, and it means it is death. Namely, God will not give the spirit of repentance, so you cannot but just go the way of death. But I hope you will be thankful. Some of you commit sins willfully, and could not repent on your own. But God gave you a couple of chances of repentance. How thankful it is! How did God of justice give us this kind of chance? It is because God is also God of love. How much love did Abraham receive from God? Abraham was trusted and loved by God so much. And when this Abraham asked God before God was going to punish Sodom and Gomorrah, God gave forgiveness. God answered Abraham's plea many times. 
It is the same here. Brothers and sisters, now, if a believer whose name is written in the book of life in heaven finishes his life on this earth and his spirit and soul leave the body, how will he go to heaven? If the spirit leaves his body, will it be automatically pulled up to heaven like a piece of iron is drawn to a magnet? Or can the spirit clearly see the way to heaven so that it can find the way to the heavenly kingdom by itself? How can it find the way when it's completely unfamiliar? When the spirit comes out of the body, the object that recognizes its entity is not the body but the spirit. So, the spirit can see the body from which it came out. It might get surprised when it sees the body with the same shape as itself or become confused about as to what is going on. When one dies and the spirit comes out of the body, he sees his body lying down. Even if the person listened to God's word and knew these facts very well, when the spirit has just come out of the body, it feels everything is new and strange until it adapts itself to the spiritual realm. So when the saved spirit comes out of the body, in order for that spirit not to get surprised but reach the heavenly kingdom safely, God sends two angels beforehand to wait for the Spirit. This is the reason why many people say they see angels at their deathbeds. Close to death they can see. One who is not saved knows that the messengers of hell in black robe will take him to hell. So they die in fear. But those good believers will die with a smile on their faces. They die happily with their eyes closed. Why? They see two angels in white coming to take them. They already know that they are saved. They know that they are going to heavenly kingdom, so they die in happiness. But some believers struggle because of fear, and only at the final moment they close their eyes and die in peace. This kind of person is at the crossroad. They may be saved or may not be saved. They may barely go to paradise. That's why they are in great fear. So if you lead praise and help a person in that situation and drive away the enemy devil and plant faith in him in that moment, he may receive shameful salvation. If a person does not have enough faith to be saved at the moment, he may be saved that way, in that manner. John chapter 20 verse 12 says, And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. Also the first part of Luke chapter 16 22 says, Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. As you see, the saved soul will be treated with honor. He was not just taken or dragged, but he was carried away by the angels. If the spirit leaves the body, because that person is a son or daughter of God, the angels respect him or her. It also says angels in plural form. So we can see that it's not only one angel, it's two of them. Likewise, God makes two angels wait until the spirit of a saved believer comes out of the body. From there, they escort it at both sides and guide it to the heavenly kingdom. Now, where will this saved spirit go first, being guided by the two angels? It will not go into the heavenly kingdom immediately, but it will have to stay in the waiting place of heaven. The reason it cannot go into the heavenly kingdom immediately, but has to stay in the waiting place, is because it needs time to adapt to the spiritual realm. If you go up to high mountains, it is difficult to breathe because of the lack of oxygen. If you go up to about 4,000, 4,500 meters, it is very difficult to breathe. You have to walk slowly and speak quietly. Then, if you are to live on high mountains for a couple of months, can you live there or not? Will you be able to live there? Yeah, yes, you can. Why? 
You can adapt yourself. It's just that the beginning is difficult. It's very difficult on the first couple of days. You feel very different. But if days go by and maybe three weeks pass, then you get accustomed to it. If you stay there for more than a month, then you are completely used to it. So you can live there. When our spirit first goes out of the body, you may be surprised because everything is different and you are in the spiritual realm. That's why God gives us some time to adapt ourselves. The place for that is the grave, which is the waiting place. Unlike the physical body, the spirit that is separated from the body does not feel any weight and it feels like flying into the sky. Many of you have experienced something like that. After you get healed or received a great answer from God and you are so happy that you feel like you are flying. Or when you receive the Holy Spirit and are full of the spirit, then your body feels very light and you feel like flying into the sky. I think most of you have this kind of experience. Also, because everything in the spiritual realm is new, it also needs time to learn the basic things about it. They have to learn about how to act in the space. They will learn basic things. It's just like us to astronauts. Before they actually go to the space, they have to be trained to be able to move in a space-like environment without any gravity. You cannot go to outer space without going through the training. Without training, you cannot be on a spaceship. You have to go through the training for a long time. You have to adapt your body to that environment. Otherwise, you will feel very difficult. The food will be different. If you are not accustomed to zero gravity, you will be flying everywhere and you cannot hold a thing. Of course, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a spoon. But if there is a spoon, if... It will fly everywhere and it might hurt people too. But they still have to move here and there to do their job. Those who are not trained will be bumping everywhere. But those who are used to it will be able to have the balance. So, where are the saved spirits expected to go to adapt after the stress of the time that was spent on the earth? This situation and place was different before and after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus. Before the resurrection and ascension of the Lord, a portion of the place called grave was the waiting place of heaven. That is why in the Bible we can find some forefathers of faith confess that they would go to the grave after they would die. In Genesis 37-35, Jacob said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. Job chapter 7 9 says, When a cloud vanishes, it's gone. So he who goes down to shore does not come back. Moreover, number 1633 says that Korah and his people who had stood against the man of God Moses went down alive to Sheol. These people were not saved once. And because it says they also went to Sheol or grave, we can see that Sheol or grave is the waiting place not only for saved souls but also for those who are not saved. We can find more about this in Luke chapter 16. The rich man and the beggar named Lazarus died. The rich man was suffering from the flames of the grave while Lazarus was at the bosom of Abraham. Didn't this rich man know God? He knew God, but he didn't live by the word of God. Also between them, there was a great chasm so that they could not come and go. The chasm is not just small part. It is an imaginably big and it is endless chasm. So putting these things together, we can see that when a man dies, he would go to the grave and the grave was divided in two parts. One for those who will be saved and the other for those who will not be saved. Here, the part for those who will be saved is the upper grave belonging to heaven and the place for those who will not be saved is the lower grave grave or heads which belongs to hell. Therefore, the waiting place for those who were saved before the resurrection of the Lord was the upper grave. There are some very exceptional cases too, but I will explain about them in the next session. So, in the Old Testament, who is the master of this upper grave for saved souls? 
It was Abraham, the father of faith. That's why in the Old Testament, people were with Abraham when they died. Oh, even in New Testament, the person was Abraham. What I mean is the time before Jesus took the cross and resurrected. After Jesus took the cross and resurrected, people do not go to the side of Abraham. Why? Even Abraham is in New Jerusalem now. What does the Bible say then? What did Jesus say to one criminal? He said he would be with him in paradise. Now, people go to the side of the Lord. We are asked in the Old Testament, people were at the bosom of Abraham until Jesus took the cross. After the Lord took the cross, resurrected and ascended into heaven, if a believer dies, he will be with the Lord. He will stay in the upper grave for three days and then he will go to paradise, which is in the heavenly kingdom. In the Old Testament, all saved souls were waiting at the upper grave at the bosom of Abraham. But after our Lord's resurrection and ascension into heaven, the waiting place of heaven was changed. In John chapter 14 verse 2, Jesus says, I am going there to prepare a place for you. After the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, a house in heaven is being built for each one. So after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord, those who were saved during the Old Testament days and used to to be in the upper grave, they moved to the waiting place which is located in the heavenly kingdom. The upper grave belongs to heaven, but it is not located in the part of heaven called the kingdom of heaven. Now, where is this waiting place in heaven? There is a place called paradise in the kingdom of heaven, and since the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord, the out, outskirts of this place called paradise is used as the waiting place for heaven. They stay in the upper grave for three days and they go to the waiting place in the outskirts of paradise. In the Old Testament, they were waiting in the upper grave. They were waiting there until the Lord took the cross and resurrected and ascended into heaven. But after our Lord resurrected and ascended into heaven, the situation changed. So those who are saved in the New Testament era, when their spirits leave their bodies, they will first go to upper grave and stay there for three days to adapt themselves to the spiritual realm, and then they will move to the out, 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 outskirts of paradise. Here too, there are some special exceptional cases, and I will explain to you about them in the next session. When I say those who are saved move to the heavenly kingdom from the upper grave, you can think they are already in the kingdom of heaven. And yet, why did God make a waiting place at the outskirts of paradise and let them stay there? It is because those who are saved can go into their own dwelling places only after the judgment of the great white throne. They have not yet received the judgment yet, which means they haven't gone through the judgment of reward. So, before the great judgment, they stay there. But those who go to New Jerusalem will stay in the upper grave for three days and go to New Jerusalem directly, immediately. Why? They have nothing to be judged. They have no forms of evil. They are sanctified. They are faithful in all God's kingdom. So anything they did will be rewarded. That is why they don't have to be judged at all. They go to New Jerusalem immediately. It's not about those who go to third kingdom of heaven. Do you understand why? It's only for those who go into New Jerusalem. After all, human cultivation is over, and after the millennium kingdom, God decides each one's dwelling places and rewards for what each one has done according to precise justice. For those who go to New Jerusalem, it is their home. But for those who are staying in the outskirts of paradise before the judgment, they have to come down to the earth to the Lord at his second coming. Their spirits come with him. Then, what will happen to them? Their bodies will resurrect from the tombs and they will combine with their spirits in the air. Then they will have complete spirit, soul, and body. After the seven-year wedding banquet is over, God will purify this earth with his word again, as clean as the Garden of Eden. And we will come down to this earth. And we have something to do for 1,000 years on this earth. We have some work to do. Why? The people of flesh will give back to many children. 
during that time there is no disease they will be back they will give birth again and again so they have to be filled in a very short time so you have to diligently teach them when the time comes at the end of the 1000 years god will set free the enemy devil for a moment and let them deceive people so you should diligently teach them so that they will not be deceived what is amazing is that even though you will teach them so much for 1000 years they will still be deceived they will take the way of hell. You don't understand it, do you? Even after they see everything, but the same today, even after seeing so many signs and wonders and powerful works of God, and they see and hear the ex and experience so many things, they still commit sins leading to death and they go to the world. They just forsake the church and faith. It's the same today. I taught you so much, and you so experience so many things by yourself. I taught you so many things wonders and signs yet people leave the church and go the way of death with the love for the world you can see that kind of people around you god decides each one's dwelling places and rewards for what each has done according to precious justice i will explain about this in more detail later too until before the great white throne judgment more precisely until before the lost coming back in the air the outskirts of paradise is the waiting place for those souls who are saved now you may wonder if everybody has been saved since the creation is waiting in the waiting place how big is that place why don't you imagine it? Is paradise as big as this earth? Will it be as big as earth if we stretch it? Or is it maybe ten times bigger than earth? Please imagine something quickly. Or some of you didn't even imagine at all. Yes, paradise is so much bigger and wider than men can ever imagine. Let us compare the sizes of this physical universe. If you compare the size of the galaxy to which this earth belongs and the size of the whole universe, the whole universe is so big that our galaxy will only be like a small spot. So, we cannot really imagine the size of the universe. Even this universe that God gave to us in this physical world is so big beyond our knowledge. And how much bigger will the heavenly kingdom be? Therefore, I hope you can believe that all saved souls since the creation of the world can stay in the outskirts of paradise, which is the waiting place for heaven. Even in this universe that God gave to us in this physical world is so big beyond our knowledge. And how much bigger will the heavenly kingdom be? You don't have to be worried. How can we just say tens of thousands time big, times bigger? Heavenly kingdom is stretched out endlessly and especially paradise will accommodate most number of people. So it is really endless. You have some parents who do not lead a very good Christian life but are just saved. They often say just before their death that they had a dream and saw a green pasture. It is very, it's a very wide plain and there are so many beautiful flowers and there are people in white sitting in small groups and having lovely conversations with one another or some people see some visions before they die there is a person who saw a vision by god's grace before he died he saw the heavenly kingdom into which he will go and explained to his family members like this i saw such a, a place then where would this man go he was going to paradise he didn't say he saw a house there because he was going to paradise he saw only the green pasture wide plain and beautiful flowers but not a house if he saw a house he would go to at least the first kingdom of heaven and according to what kind of house he saw we can see whether it is the first kingdom or second kingdom or third kingdom or new jerusalem you listen to lectures on heaven and you know so just by hearing what they saw you can understand which heavenly kingdom they will go now what kind of place is this waiting place of heaven in the outskirts of paradise since i keep on saying a waiting place does any one of you think it's a simple space with many chairs like a waiting room or a train station 
If it were true, how suffocating and boring it would have been for the people who died in the Old Testament since they had had to wait there for thousands of years. But the waiting place of heaven in the outskirts of paradise is not that kind of a place at all. I will also explain to you about paradise in detail later. But even this waiting place at the outskirts belongs to heaven. So it is adorned much more beautifully than any beautiful place on this earth. Let me just explain a little bit about this place. In the endless grass-covered plain are blooming so many beautiful flowers. Unlike this world, there aren't any insects or any dirt, so you can just sit or lie down anywhere. Also, the grass is so soft that you feel very comfortable. Even though you roll on it, you don't have to worry about getting grass stains. Even if you sleep, there's no worry of getting injured. Even if you sit on the grass for a long time, you don't have to worry about getting sunburned. The temperature is neither cold nor hot. It's the most appropriate temperature. With a softly blowing breeze, sweet fragrance of flowers and beautiful sounds of birds come together. So just by being in that space, you feel so happy. Then, what will the people do in this waiting place of heaven? I will continue to explain about this in the next session. Let me conclude the message. In this session, before you start the journey to the heavenly kingdom, I explain to you about the way to get a ticket to the heavenly kingdom. Most of you must have this ticket to heavenly kingdom. And if you don't have it, please first receive this ticket from today. Also, I explained to you that the saved spirit will leave the body and arrive at the waiting place of heaven. And how these waiting places are different in the times of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, do you already have the ticket to go to the heavenly kingdom if God called your spirit now, right now, at this very moment? Then, you already belong to the heavenly kingdom. Therefore, even in this earth, to the extent that you live by the word of God, you will feel the happiness and heart-moving emotions of heavenly kingdom. And we should know that it is such a happy thing to have the heavenly kingdom in our heart and to leave this world without any worries. In this world, even the richest people, like the owner of biggest business conglomerates and politicians with so much fame and authority always have worries and concerns. But if you follow goodness and spirit to be worthy of being heavenly citizens, you will always feel the emotions and happiness of heavenly kingdom. I pray in the name of the Lord that you will all accomplish the kingdom of heaven in your heart so that you will always rejoice and give thanks and glory to God every day. Hallelujah, Almighty Father God of love. Please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, cables, and internet all over the world. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues, and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs, and viruses, and infirmities go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. All epidemic diseases such as colds and fever go away from them. Protect them, Father, from any kind of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers, stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's disease, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from the polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them. 
like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes, let the deaf come to hear, and let the mute begin to speak. Heal accidents after effects. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Bless them to conceive a baby. Father, please give them blessing to conceive a baby. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bones of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous, and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters, and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their homes and business, and their work with the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit, with heavenly hosts and angels, and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they may do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I have met and experienced God and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.